Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jacob Restituto and I'm a musician from Northport, New York and today I have the absolute pleasure of having JJ and Hannah from Overcoats here on the channel. It is an absolute pleasure for you guys taking the time and you guys coming on the channel. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, we're excited to be here. Absolutely. So it is fun when I have fellow New Yorkers here on the channel because you guys get New York culture like nobody else. I mean, you guys... I, we were talking before we started filming. Hannah, you're not originally from New York, right? No. Well, it's kind of complicated because I was born here, but not raised here. And JJ okay. was raised here, but not born here. Okay. Um, but we do consider ourselves to be New Yorkers. And we've been living here as a band for like almost seven years. So, Absolutely. You've been immersed in the culture then. Definitely. There's very, very, very few people, especially in the city area, that can say, especially the Manhattan area too, even further, that can say, I don't know what part of the city you guys are in, but that can say they were actually like from New York, especially in the arts industry, you know, in the music industry and everything. Everybody, it's like LA or New York, like nobody's really born there. You know, it's, yeah. you come from Long Island, you come from up Westchester, which is to me, upstate New York. <laughs> yeah, I don't count Westchester as the city. Oh, 100%. I want to be, no. be clear on, Absolutely. out on the internet. <laughs> Absolutely. And just like Queens and Brooklyn are not part of Long Island. Right. Come on. That's culture right there. So that's it's funny. Culture. I was on a live stream yesterday and somebody from Pakistan was like, wait, I'm really confused. If New York, what what is New York City if Manhattan is Manhattan? And he was like, had his whole brain carfuffle because I'm like, well, it's actually, and I was like, you know what? If you're not from around here, I guess I would understand why it's so confusing. And I had to go into, oh, well, there's the five boroughs where... It's all in New York City as a conglomerate. It was it's funny. But then you have these yeah. subcultures inside of New York that are like, oh, no, Long Island. It, that's a different line. It's totally different, you know, Long Island and, this, and Queens, even though it's the same piece of land. Totally. Absolutely. So can you guys introduce yourself a little bit and, and tell about a little bit of your backstory and, and overcoats and everything? Sure, yeah. So um, we are a duo. It's just us. Um we met each other like 10 years ago now, I want to say. Um, and we met in Connecticut in college. We were friends for a few years and then decided to try writing music together. And thus was born Overcoats. Um, so we write all the songs together and um, we're inspired by folk and electronic music now we're i guess indie pop um and yeah we're we sing everything in harmony so that's um wow it, yeah it, the, it that makes it fun all the live um, gigs are sung fully in harmony yeah i Pretty appreciate much. that that's actually yeah. a lost art that's we really think so cool. too yeah um we were yeah we love like simon and garfunkel and Very stuff cool. like that we like to say um we like to compliment ourselves and say we're trying to do kind of a modern day simon and garfunkel thing so no i love that love that is that. really cool yeah so when did you st can you can you back step a second and say when did you start the band when did you guys you met in you said you met in college yes we so met in college. it started in college Yes, it started um, in our very last semester of college, so spring of 2015. Okay. And how did you get the ball rolling from, you know, where you are now to where you where you started from? Like, what does that look like for you guys? Because I think that, so like I mentioned before backstage or whatever you want to call it, back Zoom, um, is... I love inspiring other artists and talking to other artists that, like about their story. So maybe they can, somebody can like just catch on and be like, Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Would have never thought of that. Oh, that's a cool idea. Or, Oh, that's, you know, I love that. So like, you know, just sharing your story and, and, and how you, you know, started to where you guys are, what you guys are up to today. Yeah. That's a great, yeah. I, I think it's interesting because when we started in spring of 2015, SoundCloud, mm -hmm was a really big thing. Like a lot of music was still only happening on SoundCloud and not yet. Like, I think the, like the mass, the mass exodus to Spotify hadn't 
was like in the process of occurring. Um, but SoundCloud was a very like freeing platform because you could just upload music whenever you wanted. Um, and we definitely use that to our advantage, I think. Um, and so like to artists that are starting now, I think that that might look a little different doing the the soundcloud route might look a little different because soundcloud is not what it once was um and maybe the equivalent now is like putting your music on tiktok and wow, you know yeah. getting a following like that um i'm not sure what the equivalent is but finding finding artist friendly platforms that um where where you don't need to sort of like wait for other people to give you the go ahead i think was what was crucial mm -hmm. um and from soundcloud we then built our way up to spotify and had you know more of a team around us but at the very beginning it was just the two of us and it was our soundcloud page and us emailing <laughs> literally anybody that we could find on the internet um like music blogs and i'm trying to think what else venues to let us play a show yeah anything i relate to this story so much man it's so it's so funny i think it, i think it's lost to some degree on the modern musician modern musician right i mean we, it's not like we started in the 70s right but um, right. like the conceptually even in the past five ten years it's changed so much like i dropped out of college in 2014 to do music full-time and uh did the same exact thing you know it was e every email to venues trying to play like you know all coming from me you know whether it be a restaurant i was trying to play in because i you know i was more acoustic kind of stuff or a, a venue and it's just all grassroots stuff but what's really interesting is you mentioned almost finding like an untapped area in the music industry uh, and trying to use that to your advantage which at that time was soundcloud uh, but i'd almost compare it you know 20 30 years ago in the 90s and, and early 2000s to almost like mixtapes you know, you, you would put out, put out your mixtapes and you put out, you know, now SoundCloud. And now to some degree, it's kind of changed to TikTok because uh, there's a lot of viral stuff going on on TikTok. And there's stuff that lives for about 13 seconds. But then there's people that, that seem to have made careers. Like I've, I saw a guy that I literally saw blow up, had a couple viral, a couple viral songs, not just one on TikTok. And now he's playing Macy's Day Parade, the Jingle Ball. Like he's like, you know, actually made a relative career, you know, it's like, wow, this is pretty wild, you know. Yeah, I'd love to know your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I think TikTok is amazing. Like, I think the the main thing about SoundCloud that was um, good for us at the time is that SoundCloud was a place that people went to discover music. I think mm -hmm. that's the main thing. Like, Spotify now is a place that people go to discover music, but it is so curated for you. It's re It's gone through so many different tastemakers before it hits your discover weekly playlist. Whereas SoundCloud, it was a lot more of like a free form thing. And I think TikTok is the same way where, you know, it's, um, you're kind of, if you're looking just at your for you page, you're seeing stuff from like all over the place. And, um, so kind of getting yourself out there in a place where people go to discover music is a great thing. Another thing that was big for us was a music festival called South by Southwest um which is the same thing it's a music festival that is based around the fact that it's new artists it's discovering what is new um and so kind of getting yourself in front of eyes in that way i think is really important and was definitely big for us when we played south by southwest we had we got like a manager a label like a publishing company it, it went like pretty much as well as it could have gone wow um, so can i ask a couple questions about that because that's also something i love to ask artists because i think that artists either get management way too soon and they get screwed from it or they get it way too late and they're already screwed because they never got it uh so trying to find management at the right time is a really interesting conversation uh so you you were saying that you got management by playing southwest they approached you or how did that work well, let me clarify. I think we did get management too soon. Oh, okay. And we had a manager before this manager that okay. we met at South by, but it wasn't going well. Um, and I, I would say maybe that it was too soon in the sense that we were, we didn't know enough at the time and that like, it was easy to take advantage of us, I'd say. Um, and 
but we did get there um i think with the help of that manager um although you can just apply and that works out for many people um, i think we did just apply yeah we might have just applied time. i don't recall um but yeah we just in playing a show you know managers and labels they look at the bands that are playing that year, they, they, you know, check out what they think they might like, they go to the show. So I think that happened for us, like our current manager, who's still our manager today, checked out our set and was into it. And that's how we met. Very cool. I'd love to know, <clears throat> to whatever capacity you want to talk about it, like, what are some things you would look for in good management versus bad management? Like, what are some of the things that led to bad management, you think? Or, you know, what are some of the things that you really like about this new manager? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Hannah and I did not study music. We didn't study like the music business. We we went in cold. And so we were learning as we went. Um, and I think the the thing, one of the things, I, I think the, the first person who tried to manage us um, there was not a lot of trust, um, I think in either direction. And I think that was bad. Um, the, that manager was like very much trying to nickel and dime us at a time where we literally mm. only had nickels and dimes. Sure. Um, and I think that the, the second manager we had, who's still our manager to this day, um, knew that there was going to be a period where he wouldn't be profiting from us, that we, he would have to build us as an artist um, and work with us for, you know, nine months, a year before there would be any sort of payoff, um, if that makes sense. And I think having the trust that, you um, that we could do that kind of trial period and in both directions, you know, um, mm. meant that we had a foundation of trust that we were like, we're going to, we're going to stick this out. And as long as it's, you know, mutually beneficial and we're just like in this team together, then all of the decision-making will go smoothly. And when it comes time to sign on a dotted line and, you know, and commission starts to happen, like it feels fair. Um, That's a great. And point. so I think like listening to your gut, um, that was all we had to go on in our first management situation. And, and um, it, there came a moment where we were asked to sort of sign on to this long-term contract. Um, and we didn't have like a lawyer or anything looking at it even because we saw the contract and we were like, this doesn't feel right. Um, I think if it feels exploitative or it feels unfair or it feels too good you know, to be true or that <laughs> if something in your gut is off, don't sign. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we, and I remember Hannah and I like cried. We were crying. <laughs> oh Yeah when we had to, we like went in there and we were like, we can't sign this. Like we can't work with you. And we just both were like bawling because we just didn't know <laughs> what we were doing, but it ended up being the right decision. Um, and as we learned more, we understood, you know, why it was the right decision and that there were other people out there that had our best interest in mind in a, in a more tangible way. Um, and yeah, I think go slow, you know, like management, I do mm -hmm. think management should be one of the first things that you try to get, but that doesn't mean that you have to sign on with the first person that shows an interest. Um, that's a great point. I think that, so, I mean, we're in this microwave kind of society where everything is even like, even the social media apps we use, like myself included, like I'm not, you know, screwing off society because i'm saying like, i'm part of it too it's scrolling through tiktok and or instagram like we look at like things for like a half a second you know like i'm part of it too i'm not so i'm, I'm not don't think i'm like you know shaming society but 
we all want this instant gratification of I want to be playing Madison Square Garden my first year of you know my career, and it's like we all think we can do it too, you know, and and for it's a rude awakening when you can't, but then to some degree, like you said, you don't have to sign with the first manager you meet with. Like sometimes we get desperate and trying to create these things according to our timelines, and we you know might sacrifice things along the way which you know good or bad but that's a really interesting perspective i really appreciate that hannah do you have anything to add to that um maybe a sort of pessimistic addition <laughs> which i wouldn't which is less p pessimistic and more just realist i think which is that like you've got to understand that any partner you take on in the music industry, whether that's a manager, a label, a publisher, an agent, like they may support and love your music, but at, at the core of their own self-interest is they also think they can make money off of it. And that feels gross in a lot of ways, but it's also like, an important part of it because it like incentivizes them to, you know, help you out. So, you know, it's, it's not to say that like our first manager nickel and dimed us and our <clears throat> second one didn't care about money at all. He mm -hmm. certainly like, you know, he's trying to get us super rich and famous so that he can get rich and famous. And that's sure. just, that is an inevitable part of it. There's going to be some element of like, you know, it's a business can, transaction. Yeah, sure. it's a business transaction at its foundation. And so I think that can be one of the difficult parts as you move forward in the industry of picking a manager and labels and all of that stuff. There's got to be, you know, it's a mixture. It's really a weird mixture of like love and respect and something that isn't about money at all. And then another piece of it that is like, you know what, you do want that person to be thinking about that stuff too, because they're going to, that's going to make them work harder for you also. Absolutely. Now, are you guys signed to a label at the moment? Um, we, we are putting our, mm, it's complicated. Okay. We've been on a label for our last two released records. Okay. Um, we're not sure yet what we're going to do with our upcoming music. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. That's very interesting. So we can leave it at that for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting debate, the label versus... Look, how about this? Can you talk about some of the things that you did enjoy being on the label? and, and um, or, or would you just prefer to move on to the next subject? No, we can um, talk about that. Yeah. Okay. I, think, I think in deciding whether to be on a label, there's a lot of factors. I think the benefits of a label are, you know, the name recognition, um, the connections they may have, um, the capital, you know, they can sure. probably invest a lot more in you than you might be able to invest in yourself. Um, you know, having a, a higher team of people that are working for you um, when it comes to like radio or streaming or what have you, you know, there's a lot of resources that you get from signing on to a label and it can be um, a really big stepping stone for a lot of artists. Um I think also there's major benefits to not being on a label. Um, you know, you have more creative control. Um, you're earning your money directly. Um, what else? Um, Let um, me ask you this follow-up to, to, to that, that part of the question. Uh, is this music that all you guys do, or do you guys have side gigs as well? Um, with the exception of the pandemic, Sure. Music is our main thing. Um, okay. The pandemic's obviously been very difficult, and we've both kind of taken up other um, other things. But it's less of a thing where, like in the past, we had like a job that we hated on the side, and then music. Now it's a little more like we do some other things that we enjoy doing <laughs> in addition good. to music. Um, but yeah, um, at the beginning, we both had. Um, Oh, I believe it. Full-time jobs. Yeah. yeah you probably at, made like at, a dollar a year the first year. <laughs> yeah. we. Yeah. It, it was it definitely there were, I think, I would say there's two years of like intense hustle. Mm. Um, and 
that, you know, like just being the most tired you've ever been because you have a full-time job and then at night you try to do music and that, that seems to be part of the way it goes. Um, we were lucky that that only lasted, you know, 18 months. And then we got, you know, our first record deal and we were suddenly, we suddenly had the opportunity to be paid to make the music um, or not paid to even make the music, but at least the music was being paid for <laughs> anyways. <laughs> um, and but yeah, and then, you know, from time to time, we have to pick up side hustles sure. to, to like eke out living in New York City, <laughs> um, which which oh, definitely would, would be different if we didn't live in this city. Oh, <laughs> tell me about it. I mean, look, the city is even more expensive than the island is. And I stink and get yeah. it. I was just in Texas two days ago. And the guy was telling me how much his property taxes are for the same exact house that I live in. And it was a quarter of the price. It's like, yeah. it's absurdity. It's completely absurd. But it's New York, right? <laughs> but I, I love that. I, I Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that, though. And I think that, I don't know if, I think so many people either get caught up in that, in that first, especially onlookers, they get caught up in those, those first two years. And they say, oh my gosh, look how much work they put in. It was so hard. It's impossible to make an industry. But they never you know, follow up that conversation with, yeah, but now it's their full, I mean, outside of the pandemic, it's their full-time job. They got signed to a label, you know, they're making money from it. They had millions of streams last year, you know, like there's never that end up, you know, it's either you're a nobody or you're, you know, Olivia Rodrigo or Taylor Swift, you know, it's like, there's nothing right. in between, but I think that there's so much in between, you know, it's either you're making no money. So I just put, I put up a video on my channel about like, you know, the question was, is Spotify ripping artists off? You know, and it's like, the, I didn't really get into how much they were paying, but I was I was talking about the con the concept of people either think you make no money on YouTube, I'm sorry, on, on Spotify, or you, they're thinking about the people that are making hundreds of millions, like Drake and all these people. But there's a lot of people in between that are making some, like, actual money, but nobody talks about them. They just say, oh, it's impossible to do anything in the music industry. It's a yeah, very weird dynamic. That's really interesting. Like I've never, I'm <laughs> always part of conversations about what you're describing where it's like the poll, the polls, like, um, and I don't think that Spotify pays its artists fairly. Like that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but, but there's at least um, an opportunity though. There's, you can make money from Spotify. Um, and we do. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately put out both of our full length records and our EP through a label through two different labels um, so we don't see the like direct deposit from Spotify on those any of those songs but we do have one song that is a cover song that um, neither of the two labels we didn't we released it before signing to any label um and that song we see the like financial the, the direct financial return sure. from spotify what i will say is that it it is true that you don't see much of any kind of like noticeable payoff until a song on spotify reaches a million plays which even um, then is only like thirty five hundred bucks. Oh yeah, yeah like, like people, yeah, barely both, anything. Both sides but of the spectrum. Thirty five hundred bucks, like for one song, that's not that bad. I like, completely I, agree. Yeah, and, but but I think that like there are a lot of artists whose songs will never reach a million or won't reach a million for a while. Um, and so that's tough, you know, and we're in a unique position where like, you know, we, we got lucky that that song did reach over a million. And so now we get paid from it every month, but the other, you know, 30 songs that we have are owned by labels and we don't get that money from, you know, distro kid payout <laughs> once a month. Uh, Absolutely. So yeah, it's. I think there. I think it's. It's a very like. It's very complicated because you know if we didn't sign to those labels, maybe 
you know, we wouldn't have the kind of outreach that we have and the like listeners who knows it's so who what came first the chicken or the egg a hundred percent so let me ask you this though as some for people that might want to be you know because i think i saw on your spotify wrapped on your instagram I, what, am i correct in saying that you guys had 11 million streams last year is that was mm-hmm. that right and I like think i think it was right. two point something million listeners or something along the lines of that right so as somebody say say if some a listener is watching and they they, they eat, we'll do two scenarios you know they haven't they released their first song yet you know, what would you say to them? And like, how would you recommend they promote it? And then somebody that has some more experience, what would you say to them? And how, like, how would they promote it? How would, what are you guys doing to get 11 million streams a year? And that's actually mm. just on Spotify. So one thing people also forget is that there's also Apple Music, there's Tidal, there's YouTube Music. Like, that's also only one platform. So I'd at least, you know, triple that number probably for streams, if I'm correct, right? Close to it. Well, Spotify is definitely the main way people listen to our music. But okay. yeah, we, we do have some people listening on on Apple Music, on Amazon, on Tidal, certainly. Um, but yeah, Spotify is definitely our biggest. Um, you know, it's tough. Like, I don't I don't totally know how to answer that question because um, the times are just really changing. Um, I think that there are are ways that I would maybe recommend that aren't things we do. Sure. (laughs) So it's kind of like, well, should we do them? (laughs) Um, Like, I think, I think TikTok is a really incredible platform that I personally want to utilize more and better. I'm just such an old fart. Oh my gosh. I um, relate to that comment so much. It's so (laughs) hard for me to use that platform. It's really hard. Um, (laughs) Yeah. um, I think also just not a, being afraid to like go really gorilla that's something we always talk about like um you know truly blast out an email to 200 of your closest friends and just be like please just post this and um you know those kind of small movements as they as they kind of snowball it, it does really make a difference so i think um you know doing what you can do and what you do have control over and just not really worrying about the rest, I think is like a good way to start. Yeah, that's a great point. There's this, there's a saying out there that I've heard that's, that's uh, that goes scaling the unscalable. And it's some of these things that like, you know, you, you hand out these, I mean, it's not so true anymore with this specific example, but you know, like the handing out of flyers, these gorilla things that we used to do, you know, like you do enough of these things and sometimes you know you shake enough hands kind of things and you can't obviously shake 7.5 billion hands but you can shake enough where that that person knows this person who knows this person who knows this person and it's scaling the unscalable you know yeah Mm -hmm. um i i do think like until you get to the sort of olivia rodrigo status being gorilla about things is the only way to go like i know olivia rodrigo doesn't have to send like a text message to like 15 people being like could you please stream this song on repeat like you know but but like we we don't anymore but i think we need to again (laughs) like send out those text messages being like need you to fill the room at our show in February like please come (laughs) you know and like it's just um I think it is just like so much about the like hustle um and and I think that like it's the kind of thing where it's like um like it's like lighter fluid you know like it can't it doesn't burn forever, but it helps you start the fire. Um, so like, you know, having friends stream a song that you just put out, if 200 friends stream it a lot for like two days, the algorithm on Spotify makes it seem like a lot of people are like really loving this song and they boost it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like you, like you can hire people who, you know, work with Spotify on a consulting basis and blah, 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 blah. We don't have the time or money for that, but 
we can ask our friends and family to do shit for us. And we do that all the time. Um, I think, yeah, like, like you said, like scale the unscalable, just in whatever way, you know, how. Yeah. That's a yeah. great point too. I think along that note, it's like, um, engage with your community, whether that is your friends and your family and the people that can come see you at a show, or maybe that's your online community um, and your TikTok followers or what have you, but um, really getting getting kind of like your core people excited about something, I think is an important piece. So I completely agree with that. And one thing I want to follow up with that is how important would you say your live perform, like your live aspect performance versus your online presence is? How would you, how do you balance the two? And is, do you find one more important than the other at this moment? I think that's changing a lot because um, I think, you know, pre-pandemic, um, we were touring a lot and touring was a huge way that people discovered our music. Um, you know, whether it's like they knew one song, so they bought a concert ticket or we were opening for an artist and got to be in front of a lot of new faces that way. Um, I think touring has been a really big part of our journey. One of our um, first tours, um, was like a really amazing opportunity for us. We opened for an artist named Matt Corby, who's like an Australian, um, folk soul singer. And, um, we were really like not prepared for the tour. We, you know, we didn't have a band. We had like five songs, um, but an agent took a chance on us, still our agent today. And, um, and that tour was huge and it, it really jump started. It was like lighter fluid, as JJ said, it jump started kind of getting a fan base for us. Um, these days, I think online is much more important um, because you can reach way more people and it's not dependent on whether or not people can gather in a room together. So I think online is more and more important and artists are kind of struggling to figure out how to now pretty much like change their skill set to become online influencers and all yeah. of these things It has become so important, but I'm hoping that we can get back to what we know how to do, which is play shows yeah. <laughs> soon yeah. because we don't know how to use TikTok. <laughs> oh man. You know what though? As scary and as much hate as this comment might get, you know, in the comments i am curious if we're going to see an artist that never tours and just put, puts music like an online artist that just puts music out people love they'll watch them on youtube or tiktok and they just never tour because they don't need, like they don't need to or they don't want to or you know it's almost to some degree like a, like the j coles of the world where like they kind of just go into hiding and then they release a song and then they go back into hiding and like, you know, they go, it's like, where, where is Jay? I, you know, you just never, I don't know if it's even your genre, but I just know that he's not on social media. He's, but it's almost the anti J Cole where it's like, he's only on right. social media and he just never goes out into the world. And it's just an interesting yeah. concept because like 10 years, like my, I remember first starting, you know, with YouTube and stuff. And now YouTube is my full-time job, uh, doing mu all like music stuff on it. And, and, I remember when it first started, like my family and friends were like, why are you making YouTube videos? Shouldn't you be playing gigs? And I'm like, yeah, that's great. And like, I'll definitely get better pra like practically, but like there'll be six people there. And, but there's like unlimited people online. And like, you know, this was years ago. So now even more so now with TikTok and you, people at home working from home. And it's, it's a very interesting debate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think YouTube is great. Like YouTube feels like the way of like hybridizing that because it's, mm. it allows for like longer chunks of content, um, like a full performance or like, God forbid, a full song, you know? Um, and TikTok, which I love and I, I use for like comedy more than for music is such a small sound bite. Um, so I definitely, I, I definitely think like there will be <laughs> there are artists that exist solely online because you kind of have all these different platforms 
on which you can do all the different like parts that you need. Like you do the interviews on one site and you do the live streams on another and you do the like little, you know, boomerangs on like, there's just, everything is possible. Very but, interesting. But yeah. there's for me and, and I think for Hannah, like there's nothing like, being in a venue playing. and even for the audience too i, I there's you exactly know, there's, yeah yeah but it is i'm whether it's right or wrong i wouldn't be surprised if we do see an artist that does that you know it's very I feel like it's already happening yeah i yeah i mean i agree absolutely absolutely well i want to be respectful of your time but what are some of the uh ways that people can hear your new music or, or anything upcoming that you guys are excited about that you want to talk about or share um Yes, we ways you can find us, YouTube, um, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Pandora, Tidal, Tick, TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> um, Twitter. We're everywhere. Um, we put we're out usually, a new... we're usually this is overcoats on all of those um, platforms, the social platforms um, on TikTok. We're just at overcoats. Where I does that name come from? People can find our TikTok, Hannah. Important. Absolutely. You know what? It's true. This day and age is very true. You never stink it, no, man. <laughs> oh, it's wild. Um, where did overcoats come from? Um, it came from us wanting a name for our band that... Um, sort of act like acts like a like a coat of armor you're not really sure what you're about to hear when you hear the name overcoats um i think we wanted something um sort of gender ambiguous um and something that you know like i i kind of think overcoats sounds like a punk rock band from england you know yeah. and then when you hear it it's it's what we are, um, but we like that. And we were very inspired by um, a piece of visual art by Egon Sheila. Um, and he was like a, a painter, printmaker. Um, and he did a, a really beautiful piece where there's two figures and one is sort of um, got this big overcoat on and another figure is, is kind of in the others like arm crevice and it felt very like beautiful and protective uh, and so we yeah I don't know it was it was like eight years ago who knows what we were actually thinking about but that's the story we go with <laughs> oh, I love it that's good any new music coming out soon yes <laughs> at some point yeah. soon <laughs> well, <laughs> dot 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 that's all hopefully. we can say right that's now. Yeah, totally fine the next couple months um, but we did, we released um, our second album last um, spring. We released an EP um, this summer and we just released a song yesterday. Well, that's something to talk Monday, about. Thursday. Yes, I, I apologize uh, for recently. missing that one. Last week. <laughs> last week, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's talk about that then really quick. Let's Tell me about that one. Um, that one is called Tide, and it's actually um, it's this it's part of the soundtrack for a short film um, that's about like friendship and nostalgia, regret, um, and it's it's kind of a Tide is like a, it's a slow build, very ambient, like lullaby esque. Um, so it's it's great for listening to while you work from home mm. and um also for all your christmas holiday soiree dinner parties love that are you from the mentality of releasing more music or less music as much as you can or as little more anymore? but we've never practiced it <laughs> well i mean based on what you were saying though because i love that theory i try to release as much as i can because you never know what's going to stick and you never know what people are going to like but there, some people completely disagree, and that's totally fine. But based on what you were saying, you had an album, you had an EP, and now you had a single, all within the past like eight months. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if they subscribe to the mentality. 
I think I think of us as like real. So I think it's because we make so much more than we release. It feels like we're barely ever putting anything out that we make. But in reality, like we have like fifty songs that we're just like holding on to right now. Yeah. So Why not just release them? It's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I just, that's the philosophical. Wow. That's the philosophical debate of music, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, it, in experience, like I've, it's just funny because I've released songs that I've worked on, like like hand over fist, just kind of working on it, working, and then I release it. And the people are like, yeah, this is cool. Then I'm like, okay, here's this relative demo. Release people are like, this is the best song you ever did. I'm like, this makes no yeah. sense. I don't get. It. So now yeah. I'm just like, hey, I'll just release as much as I can. You guys do what you want with it, kind of thing. Yeah. But that's so funny. Uh, last question I like to ask everybody is what is one thing you now know that you wish you knew when you started off? You guys can have two different answers if you want. Um, I think at this point I feel like, um, the best, the best, I wish I'd known throughout I, I think I knew this at the beginning, but I lost sight of it. Mm. Um, is that you as the artist are the best person to make creative decisions. Mm. Um, and honestly, also sometimes business decisions. Um, because you know your fans the best. You know your music the best. Um, and I think I lost sight of that for a couple of years in the mm. middle there. That's yeah. a great one. How about you, Hannah? I mean, that. Uh, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of another. Oh, you don't um, have to. It's fine. You can share mine, Hannah. Yeah, absolutely. I need to share it. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Welcome. I yeah. think it's super important for artists, you know, to have their goals and then like constantly like refer back to them because I agree. It's yeah. so easy to start something and then whether you get a taste of the success or even the opposite, a taste of like being smacked in the face constantly, it's hard. You got, sometimes you lose, you get disoriented and lose sight of what you are actually doing this for. And I think that that is super, super, super important. Like a recalibration almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate this. I think that there was a lot of things that people can get out of this. I just, if you guys hang out for 30 more seconds, I just want to say thank you so much. First of all, to you, both of you and also to every single person that listened or watched this however you ended up watching it or hearing it experiencing it uh, i want to say a very very uh, big thank you to you guys if you guys want to um check out the rest of the interviews here on the channel there's plenty of other stuff whether it be on spotify where you're listening or podcast or here on uh, youtube and if you want to check out my music it's the best way to support the channel i'll see you guys in the next video have a great day god bless and peace out